All right. Good afternoon and or good morning, everyone. My name is Jason Kennedy. I am the marketing manager here at Early Growth Financial Services. I'm going to be your host today on this webinar. Uh, for those unfamiliar, Early Growth Financial Services, just really quickly, we provide outsourced accounting, uh, tax, uh, financial and valuation services uh, to venture back startup companies uh, throughout the United States. Uh, if you have more information after the webinar, you'll have my contact information, or you can visit us at earlygrowthfinancialservices.com. Presenting the webinar with us today, presenting partner, is Black Founders, which you can be found at blackfounders.com. They're an organization that empowers entrepreneurs and provides founders with access to advice, mentorship, and funding. Uh, so thank you to Black Founders for participating uh, with us today. Uh, the webinar is going to be about an hour. Uh, we'll do a short Q&A after, as time allows. For questions, I encourage you to use the question window. Uh, that should be available to you on the GoToWebinar uh, console that's popped up there on your screen. Uh, for any unanswered questions or anything we can't get to during the Q&A period, uh, I will follow up with you uh, directly and immediately afterwards. And the webinar itself, if you'd like to go back and review afterwards or if you know someone that's missed on the webinar, uh, we will have this available as a recording. Uh, that we will have both on the Early Growth Financial Services website as well as the Black Founders website. Uh, we will have it on the Early Growth site in our blog. And of course, anybody that's listed as registered will email you out a link to that as well. So there's going to be a couple different ways you can review this afterwards uh, if need be. So without further ado, let's jump in to the presentation and let's introduce our panelists. We got two panelists with us today. One is uh, from Early Growth, Cirque Rowe, consulting CFO. Uh, Cirque is a principal and consulting CFO with Early Growth Financial Services and assists early stage companies through strategic financial decisions. His areas of expertise include debt and equity financing, planning, budgeting, financial analysis, cash flow management, high growth management, and cost reductions right sizing when needed. CERC brings more than 25 years of experience to early growth, including 17 years of financial leadership roles with high-tech companies. His early stage company experience includes CFO at Nuezra, an IT consulting company, VP of Finance at Covio, a semiconductor printing innovator, CFO at Gale Technologies, a leader in testing automation software, VP Finance at Tune Systems, and a controller at Nishan Systems, both data storage networking manufacturers. Prior to focusing on early stage companies, Cirque held positions as controller for the Palm Operating System Division and several divisions within 3Com. Cirque holds an MBA in Finance from UCLA's Anderson School of Business and a BA in Business Economics from UC Santa Barbara. Our second presenter is Marlon Nichols, General Partner with Cross Culture Ventures. Marlon is the co-founder and of course General Partner of Cross Culture Ventures, an early stage venture capital firm with a focus on cultural investing such as global trends and shifts in consumer behavior. Before founding CCB, Marlon was an investment director at Intel Capital where he completed his Kaufman Fellowship. Prior to his time in venture capital, Marlon led successful careers in software and strategy consulting in the technology, private equity, media, and entertainment sectors. Some of Marlon's investments include AfroStream, Gimlet, Lynn Street, LISNR, Mark One Vessel, Maven, Marantis, MongoDB, MSurvey, Sidestep, and Thrive Market. Marlon earned a Bachelor of Science in MIS from Northeastern University and an MBA from the Johnson Graduate School of Management at Cornell. Marlon was named to Silicon Republic's list of 26 venture capital professionals spearheading change in technology investing and as a member of the registry's 40 under 40 top diverse talent. So thank you to Jim for joining us today. So we'll jump right in. What we're going to talk about today, Startup Fundraising 101. 
some of the topics we're going to get into, why should we raise funds, what options are available to you, uh, popular options for fundraising, what the process looks like for fundraising when you're ready to begin, uh, how you should be leveraging your network once it becomes time to begin the fundraising process, and what investors are looking for from you when it comes time to make your presentations. So first, why raise funds? So Cirque, do you want to kind of jump in on this? Yeah, absolutely, Jason. Thank you very much for the introduction, and um, and thank you to all who are um, logged in um, for this uh, webinar. We really appreciate you taking time. We know you're really, really busy, and so um, so appreciate you taking time. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to this webinar, doing it with uh, Marlon and Jason. Um, so why raise funds? And and we're going to gear this um, conversation towards um, companies and to entrepreneurs who are looking to raise venture financing at some point, right? Because obviously, you know, if you have the kind of company which is um, which does not need um, venture backed financing, and you can grow your company organically um, or borrowing some money from banks, then then you know you should do that. Um, it doesn't you know it may not make sense to to raise funds. But really, um, you know, it's really to accelerate growth, right? It's really if you have an opportunity in front of you, whether it's from a timing perspective or a market opportunity perspective, um, to really go after a big market, and you need funds to be able to um, to accelerate on what you're trying to do. And so it may be for obviously for things like it's probably a combination of these things um, to to produce uh, some some product or or service or or, um, or or software. Um, it's obviously to hire talent, and and mainly, mainly, it's really about going after a big market opportunity. Um, the one thing that we really stress here is that this is not the time. You don't raise funds to um, validate the market, right? Because that's something that you should be doing on your own dime with your, um, you know, either either your sweat equity, some money that you have on your own. Um, that you're investing, uh, maybe some friends and family type of money, um, but you know you're not going to be going after VC money um, to try to validate the market. There was a time many years ago before the the dot com craze uh, back in the I'd say the mid to late 90s when people were raising a lot of money um, based on what we call slideware, um, PowerPoint slides with with just an idea. Um, but those days are long gone. Now more and more people and more and more entrepreneurs and companies are doing a lot more and they have a lot more traction before they actually go after uh, venture financing. Um, and if you're trying to compete with guys like that with just ideas or to validate a market, it's not going to be successful. Marlon, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I'm going to take kind of a, almost a um, contradictory uh, answer to, to what you just said, the last part, the validating the market um, piece. So when I think about uh, fundraising, early stage fundraising, I think about them in two buckets. So there's the series seed, um, which is you know pre-market um, validation. And then there's series A, when you've uh, validated that there's a market and, and now you're trying to, to grow and kind of double click or um, accelerate growth within that market. Um, my firm focuses on both. Uh, so the seed and Series A. So for for Series Seed, um, we're definitely looking for companies that have built a product, have tested the product that's working, and have um, a good sense of where they'd like to market that product, where their customers are going to come from, and are um, <clears throat> looking to demonstrate, um, you know, that that this this solution will will work. And uh, will be valued by their um, targeted uh, consumer base. Uh, so for uh, for companies like that, you know, you could put them in the bucket of um, of market market validation. Um, but you know, it, I guess it, it's all it can be all semantics, right? If if we're talking about you know not having a not having a product, not having a sense of where you're going to um, how you're going to monetize that product and things like that, then then yeah, I agree with Cirque. Um, probably not the best time for for venture capital um, dollars, but if you do have that stuff um, somewhat figured out, and you're you know if you're an enterprise company and you're trying to um, you're trying to to, to close or um, produce produce uh, a production grade solution that you can take into 
into um, beta with a potential with with any specific customer or two, then that's absolutely a, a great reason to to raise venture capital. If you're on the consumer side and um, <clears throat> you've built say a um, I don't know consumer internet uh, product and that product is um, is out in the market and it's it's doing okay um, and 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 you know maybe you have it. You have it uh, facing two different directions right now, and um, one is starting to to show uh, more positive signs than the other. And you need capital to to really accelerate that. Um, then I, I also think that that's that can be considered market validation and, and a good reason to to raise capital. Great points, Marley. All right, thank you, gentlemen. So let's talk about some of the more popular fundraising options that are available to entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I mean, you can see the list here, and and you know, it obviously starts at the end. This kind of you know maybe is 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 more in, in along along the lines of a timeline, other than maybe um, the the crowdfunding. Um, but you know, when you're first getting started, it's obviously like like we mentioned, sweat equity. You know, maybe some of your money that you put in. Um, to start a venture, um, when you're kind of starting to get going, you may borrow some money from friends and family. Um, you know, we always we always ask you to be very very careful, especially when you're talking with friends and family. Um, you know, we like to say that you know friends and family and 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 business um, don't mix very very well together, and you just have to be just make sure that you understand and that your friends and family investors also understand the risk associated with investing in 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 you and your venture. Um, and the fact that many, many companies um, will start, um, they'll get going, and then they just won't, uh, uh, it, it just won't go anywhere. And so it's not a case of, you know, hey, I'm gonna, I may, I may invest some money and and lose 20 or 30 or 40 percent of my money. In most cases, you know, the the companies that fail, um, they lose 100 percent. And so just be very, very careful when you're going with friends and family and understand the risk, and make sure that your friends and family also understand risk. Um, obviously, the next next in terms of uh, of equity financing um, or, um, and maybe even debt would be angel investors, and this would be kind of that seed stage that uh, Marlon just alluded to. Early stage, um, you know, you've got a product, it, you know, you you're making some headway. Uh, maybe you've got some sales, and you want to, um, you know, maybe take it take the the product development further along, accelerate the development. Um, go after new markets. Um, this would be a time to to in, you know to borrow you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to several million dollars. Um, next, obviously, is the venture capitalists. Um, you know that these are these are bigger players. They tend to go after um, you know maybe a little bit later stage. And, and you talk about diff different rounds of financing. You know A, B, C. I'm sure you you're, you're familiar with those. And those pertain to different stages of development, different stages of of funding requirements, um, and and I think as Marlon alluded to, he probably plays in kind of that angel investors um, slash venture capitalist kind of doing both of those things. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but I also wanted to just kind of mention venture debt because this is one that is um, a lot of people are not um, very knowledgeable about, or they have lots of questions. And venture debt is basically uh, some money that you'll be able to get from a lender. Right, not necessarily not not equity. It'll be debt, um, and you'll typically get it from the likes of a, of a bank um, or specific firms that that focus on actually doing these kinds of deals. And the big thing here is is to understand the timing of this, right? Because um, you'll you'll typically want to piggyback a round of equity financing from a VC, for example, um, and and add on a layer of venture debt. And what that venture debt allows you to do is it allows you to increase the amount of cash that you've um, generated during a, a financing, give you an extra runway, give you a little bit of extra cushion to be able to, to make sure that you're able to do everything you're, you're doing with this round of financing, um, and, 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 and give everyone, including uh, potentially the investors in the company, the equity investors, the VCs, a little bit more confidence that you're going to be able to do everything that you're supposed to be doing. To this kind of financing, um, the timing of this, and, and people say, well, you know, why should I raise venture debt when I just raised equity financing? It seems kind of silly, and it seems kind of superfluous. And 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 the the argument against that is that, you know, if 
if you try to go after venture debt after you've kind of burned through a lot of money from VCs and you've only got three or four months of cash left, uh, you're not going to be able to raise that rate around the financing from venture debt. You're only going to be able to get that when you actually have a good amount of cash in your bank account, you have a good amount of runway. That's when they're going to be most interested. And that's when you're going to get the most favorable terms. Um, and so when you do a, a, a good round of, of, of equity financing, um, it's probably a good time to just look at at least the possibility of raising venture debt. And, and, and crowd, crowdfunding, we, you know, we don't want to go into too much into detail here because um, this is not kind of what, what, you know, what, um, uh, what the focus is. Um, you can learn a lot about uh, different kinds of crowdfunding um, and we'd be pro probably perfectly happy to answer any questions kind of offline. Um, but that's obviously another, another way of raising funds for your company if the kind of company um, you have is, is, uh, is a good candidate for crowdfunding. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, um, not a whole lot to add to that. Um, so so let's, let's just go down the list. So friends and family, I look at this as, you know, you're, you, you have an idea. It's probably just, just you at that point. And um, you want to <clears throat> you want to quit your job to pursue um, building out that that idea, right? So you want to start coding if it's software, or uh, maybe doing some three D printing models if it's if it's hardware. Um, that's where I, I, I can see you going to, to friends and family. And as Cirque said, it's not a, um, a big amount of uh, a lot of money at that point. The angel investors. Um, this is where I see you know now it's uh, you've got a co-founder. Um, you know, you you probably um, you probably have some type of prototype that you can you can show uh, an angel investor to get them excited about um, the potential of the pro project that you're you're, you're building out, <clears throat> and then maybe you know it's a it's a few hundred hundred um, thousand dollars, um, maybe half a million or so that you pick up from the angels, maybe even up to a million um, from a couple of a couple or a few angels. Um, and then um, you know you take that capital, you and your your co-founder, and <clears throat> and you'd, uh, you'd you'd get the product to a to a place where you know you're ready to start testing market fit, and um, <clears throat> and you and you start that process, and you and you start to show some some level of traction, and that's when you start to to come to professional investors or or venture capitalists. Um, and uh, and, the, and then you, as I mentioned before, you go into kind of the seed stage where you know maybe you're raising a, a couple to a few a few million to validate that um, that market fit <clears throat> and to validate that the the, um, the signs of traction that you're showing at the early stages um, are real and and will continue. And then you go to Series A and B and, and et cetera. I think I talked a little bit about that before. Uh, venture debt, I, I think, is is super important, uh, even more so on the hardware side than it is on the software side. Um, the hardware companies are capital intensive, and as founders, um, you know, you should you should be somewhat um, concerned or focus on. Uh, you should keep an eye on uh, how much of your company you're um, you know you're trading at the early stages in terms of equity. And uh, venture debt is a good way to balance that, right? So if you're a hardware company and you need to to raise maybe 15, 15 million um, to to get the product, you know, out the door and fully into pro, into production, um, you know, maybe you're raising 10 million in in um, <clears throat> in equity from venture capital firms, and the other five million is is coming from from debt. Um, and as Cirque mentioned, you know, the the venture debt. Um, Folks, they're not interested in in funding a company, and, and usually, unless there are you know some strong venture partners that are um, a part of the deal as well. So it's it's always a complementary thing. It's not um, either or. Um, it's just a, it is a great way to um, uh, raise more cash or capital without um, giving up giving up equity. Although there are some forms of venture that that can um, turn into equity in there. Warrants that could be attached to it and things like that, um, but you know, you, you talk to your uh, talk to your 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 attorney and your venture investors to help you navigate that. And then um, crowdfunding, I see it as an alternative almost to to the friends and family, and and in some cases, um, angel investment. 
um, but more so friends and family. So, and I think this is particularly um, useful for companies that are, are building physical products. Uh, it's, it's just a way to, you know, show uh, some, you know, even like CAD drawings of, of what you're planning to, 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 to build and um, get people to su support it um, financially uh, with a promise that, you know, they'll be first in line to receive the product once it's, once it's ready. So it's just another way to, um, to, to bring in non-dilutive funding, actually, um, and to help you get on your way. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's talk a little bit about the fundraising process. I mean, obviously, this is very high level. It can be pretty intricate, but uh, just some, some basic points to think about for everybody as they kind of enter the realm of fundraising. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, you know, from, from, from our perspective is, is just making sure you know exactly what you're trying to do. You know, have a plan. Um, you know, put together some some plans um, to and understand what you're using the funds for um, and how much you're going to need. And and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about it. But you know, really, really focus on kind of big milestones that you're trying to achieve um, because those are going to. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more about milestone financing. Um, but obviously, I think this is pretty pretty straightforward. Um, you know, at some point um, when you're ready, you're going to need to start arranging. Uh, meetings um, with potential investors, and this is the area where I say you, know, you should get out in front of this earlier rather than later. You know, you want to um, start the process of getting introduced to investors and 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 getting your name out to investors um, earlier rather than later. They're not going to take a meeting initially, but understanding who you want to talk with um, and figuring out how you're going to get introduced to them um, earlier on is 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 important because you'll you'll realize. That when you go through the process, this it's a a full time process, and it, and everything takes just a little bit longer than you think, and so just getting out in front of it, um, and then obviously you know preparing, um, and we'll talk a little bit about kind of what you want to prepare in terms of documentation um, in in preparation for investor meetings in, in later slides. Yeah, let's let's just keep moving. Um, I think I think a lot of this will um, be hashed out as we as we get into the details. So Marlon, do you want to talk a little bit on the, the networking side from you know the VC perspective? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so just to put things into perspective, uh, you know, um, some of the top VCs will get uh, hundreds of emails from entrepreneurs on a on a weekly basis. Uh, so you know, just given everything else that's on your plate, working with your existing portfolio. Um, Investigating, uh, you know, the companies that are are already in your pipeline for potential investment. Um, you know, board meetings. Uh, you're probably doing uh, speaking engagements, webinars. Um, you know, a bunch of other things. It's virtually impossible to get to all those emails in, um, you know, in say a, a given week. Uh, some of us try really hard to, um, you know, to to respond to everything that comes in. Uh, but the reality of it is you're going to prioritize. And the way that you typically prioritize is um, based on where uh, that email is coming from. So is this an entrepreneur that I've worked with in the past? Okay, great. Then I'm going to, um, if we had a good experience together, then I'm definitely going to um, prioritize that email. Is this an introduction that's coming in from uh, another VC that I've um, you know, worked with before? Or that has shared, um, you know, interesting or lucrative deals with me in the past. Then yes, uh, I'm definitely going to to prioritize uh, those. Or you know, anyone else in my network that that I really trust, right? That I have a a, a strong and solid relationship with. Um, you know, I see an email come in from them. I'm going to respond. That's the way that you want to um, to to be introduced or approach a, a, a VC or an investor. Um, it, it, you just come in with so much more credibility, and it's um, it's not to say that you should never you know reach out reach out cold. You got to get your hustle on and do do whatever um, you know you need to do. Uh, we're not always uh, I guess connected to you know to to, to the same people. Um, but that said, uh, it, it's it's almost a, a test, right? Because if you think about the, the you know, um, one of the major roles of the CEO of an early stage company 
is like uh, he or she is a salesperson, right? They've got to um, convince uh, first their co-founder or um, you know early employees to come on this journey with them and do this crazy thing, you know, quitting whatever job or industry they're in now, um, moving away from the the comfort of that lifestyle and doing this uh, this this roller coaster thing that's called entrepreneurship. Then it's about doing that same thing for customers. You're going to have to be able to sell um, the world on your vision for this company and this product. And if you can't, you know, um, do that uh, with uh, you know folks that have relationships with with investors, then it's kind of a you know it's not a red flag, but maybe it's a yellow flag, right? Why why can't you um, connect with someone that knows me? Um, and have them, you know, speak highly of you and make that introduction. Is there, you know, are you are you going to be capable of of selling um, this company um, or selling the the solution that this company is offering? So um, yeah, if you can, if you can, I would definitely go the way of um, of a warm introduction. Um, but Mar Marla, that you raised a really really great point about being a sales salesman. Um, uh, founder being a salesman because that that is their their job for you know probably the, the the first several years of the company selling themselves selling the company to to anyone to to everyone that they're talking with um, and and that's a really really great point you know the one um, one thing that I will add here um, is is just on the last bullet point um, and that's basically using the startup ecosystem and 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 this is where you know obviously if you have intros if you're already a, an established player if you've already been a successful entrepreneur um, and 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 you've had a successful exit or two or more then it's going to be relatively easy for you to get introductions and and to and to meet with um, investors um, but if you if you don't if you're not if you're a first timer uh, you know and you really don't know everyone that you need to know um, then as Marlon said, you need to get out there and start selling yourself. And I would, you know, suggest obviously speaking with and, and networking with lots of other entrepreneurs. Um, but use your startup ecosystem. And by that, what I mean is that there is an ecosystem um, out there wherever you are, um, whatever region of the country or world you're in. There's an ecosystem of of players, of of partners, of service providers who work in the startup um, uh, ecosystem. And that would be things like um, bankers and lawyers, um, you know, uh, accounting service firms. So, for example, early growth, and I'll put in a little bit of a plug for us here, is we play in this space. We know all the players. We know who the best service providers you should be working with. We can make introductions to investors, um, and that's one of the you know, great value adds that we provide as a company. But everyone that you're working with, everyone, whether it's customers, whether it's vendors, whether it's partners, whoever it is, they should be potential uh, sources of introductions for you, um, whether directly to a VC um, that you want to meet or to someone else who has a, uh, a, 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 a link to the VC. So um, you should be using everyone. And that's one of the first questions you should be asking when you're talking with partners, potential partners, is, hey, are you going to be able to help me uh, when it's time for me to, to, to raise funds? And if the answer is, well, we don't really play in that space, then I would encourage you to maybe you know talk with others who who, who can help you in the future. Yeah, um, you know, outside of fundraising, if you're if you're a new entrepreneur um, or or new to this this uh, this thing, then you should be finding you know friends and mentors and and colleagues that have done it before, um, for if for nothing else to learn from their experience. Um, and I think if you approach it from from that um, uh, perspective or, or from that um, the point of view or direction, then it, you know the interactions become much more um, authentic and, and you get a lot more out of it. And if you know just put yourself in the shoes of that experienced entrepreneur that, that's well networked, you know if, if I'm coming to them and they can see right through it that hey, I, I know that you're connected to XYZ, venture professional so I'm just trying to build this relationship with you so that you'll ultimately make that introduction right it, it, it'll come across whereas and, and they'll be less um, inclined to connect with you and spend real time with you whereas if you know you're saying hey I'm building you know XYZ kind of company and I know that you had great success with your la 
last two companies in the in a similar space. We'd love to you know talk to you about some of the challenges that, that you experience and, and get your take on what I'm on, on what I'm building, uh, and approach it from from that standpoint. And well, then you end up building a real relationship. You probably um, uh, could land an advisor um, for your company, um, and you know from a when I when I get a, um, an introduction from an entrepreneur um, that I trust that says, "Hey, I'm I'm advising this <clears throat> this startup," um, you know, I, I take that a little bit even more seriously than, "Hey, I'm connected to um, to this this wonderful um, uh, woman that's starting a company, and uh, I think you should say it's an interesting company. I think you should take a look. Um, that's great too. But if they're you know if they're willing to stand up and say, hey, I'm, I'm investing my time, uh, which is precious, into this thing because I believe so much in what they're doing, it speaks volumes. So um, try to build those authentic relationships with um, your peer set. Great. Very good. So, so when it comes time to get in front of the investors, when it's, they've, they've landed the meeting, and it's time to get prepared. Let's talk a little bit about what founders, entrepreneurs need to get together and have prepared and be able to speak to once it's time to get in front of those investors. Sir, do you want to start us off here? Well, yeah, I think Marlon would probably be um, would would probably have a great um, advice in here too. But these are basically the main three things, right? The elevator pitch is, you know, we 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 said, hey, what, you know. You're going to be stuck in an elevator with someone, and you're going to explain to them what what, uh, what you're going to do while you're going up the six or seven flights um, in an elevator. So in 30 seconds, 40 seconds, explain to me what 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 you do, what your company does, and it shouldn't be a description of your product or service. It should be, you know, basically what you know what big thing that you're trying to achieve, how you're changing the world, um, your vision, your passion, um, and and hone it into a message that in 30 seconds you can. It, it, Get someone to get excited um, and interested in what you're doing. Um, yeah, the executive summary is kind of the next step, which is you know a, a one sir? to two. Yeah. Before you go on, let me just uh, chime in. Um, so on the elevator pitch, I've I've um, you know I get pitched a lot, and um, you know there are a lot of times where I walk away like, okay, you just gave you just said a lot of words. I don't understand um, what what you're building. Why it's important um, and why there's a you know there's a huge market for it, right? So if you can convey those things, um, you know, uh, pretty quickly, I'm building you know this widget, um, and this widget's important because there's there's a lack of these types of widgets in in the marketplace, and and it's necessary because of X Y Z. Oh, and by the way, my team has a lot of experience in um, in this space. Uh, so I know firsthand that you know uh, everything that I've just told you is it, you know is is valid. Um, that that'll get my attention versus you know just a lot of words and a lot of um, uh, you know um, buzzwords and, and and things like that. Yeah, great point. And so, executive, sir, summary, wanna... executive summary would be a one to two pager that you could um, forward on to people that it gives a little bit more information, um, has more information about kind of the, the, the progress that you've made, um, uh, maybe I mentioned the, the, the team that you've developed, the market that you're going after, um, something that conveys a little bit more information on, a, um, on, on paper that you could send out um, to people who are interested in finding a little bit more um, about your company. Yeah. So on this one, um, I would say if you're gonna do an executive summary, keep it, keep it to a page. Um, and you know, let's not. I don't want to read a page um, worth of words. So I, you know, I'd like to see charts. I'd like to see images. Um, you know, where it looks almost like a slide, um, like a summary slide of of, of what you're building, your team is, what the market is, and all that stuff. Um, so you can do that. Um, what I actually prefer is because a lot of this stuff is going to come in through through email. If you have a one paragraph description of, um, or maybe even two paragraphs of what it is that, again, what what you're building, why it's different from you know um, everything else out there, and why it's important, and who you are, you and your team are, um, 
you know that can be that can be passed along in an email with uh, your pitch deck attached to it, then uh, that's that's more useful, right? Um, what I'm not going to do is is read a hundred you know two page um, uh, pros like the summaries of um, of different businesses. I just don't have the the, the time, the bandwidth to to do that. Um, so yeah. I, I've also I've also seen this this mistake made. Um, it's something you should avoid. To, to Marlon's point about something that's easy to read, something that's easy to grasp. I've seen someone um, say, "Okay, I need to fit as much information as I can on one page because that's kind of what I've been told to do," and they cram it with you know just a bunch of stuff that you know, and and they and they reduce the font um, to cram more stuff on it, and and it's just it's just it, that's not effective. In fact, it's a complete turnoff to anyone who gets it. Um, so just really think about the message that you want to send, the highlight of it, um, and 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 really um, uh, emphasize that. And then we'll we'll get into the pitch deck part of it um, in later slides. But the pitch deck is the is the slides um, that, that you're going to be uh, presenting to investors, and you'll, you'll be sending it to them in advance of that meeting. I think that's a great segue. Cirque, over to the key slides of your pitch deck and what should be in there. Uh, Marlon, do you want to start us off here and talk a little bit about what you'd be looking for in this pitch deck? Sure. So, um, so it's even a bit simpler than this, <laughs> actually. Um, but what I'm looking for at the at the beginning is uh, what is the problem that that you're setting out to to, to solve um, and you know, be specific about the size of that problem, and you know, you got to remember who you're who you're speaking with, right? Like, we can be friends and um, you know have great conversations and all that stuff, but when it comes to the business of investing, it is a business of investing, um, which means uh, specifically that I'm putting in a certain amount of uh, of, of capital um, to see a certain amount of capital returned to me, um, and it only makes sense at a certain scale. So, you know, if the if the market size, if the, the, the size of this problem, the opportunity associated with this problem is not doesn't have the potential to be a billion dollar business or in some cases maybe a five hundred million dollar business, depending on the size of the investment, um, then it's a non starter, right? So so I want to hear and I also want to hear that, you know, this is a real problem, right? This is this is something that it's not a me too play. Um, I'm just, you know, this is hot right now, so I'm just going to jump in and do the same thing that everyone else is doing. I love um, when entrepreneurs are starting companies that address real pain points um, <clears throat> that haven't um, been adequately addressed in the past. So that's that's what I'm looking for in in that in that slide or or that slides those couple of slides. Then I want to hear about what it is you're building, right? So how are you approaching this problem? How, um, you know, what specifically are you are you creating, and how is it different than um, than how this problem? How is your approach and how is your solution different um, in in two ways that this uh, problem or challenge has have you know people have tried to address them in the past, right? And then I want to know specifically: Is that differentiation within technology? Is it within, um, you know, process? Is it um, is it none of the above? And this is just a, um, a a time to market play. Just be very very clear about that. And and then alongside that, I need to understand how you sustain that um, that competitive advantage, right? Is it sustainable, right? Um, you know, is this thing just dead so? <laughs> So it's that simple that you know someone could uh, spin it up in you know in, in a couple of weeks and then you have more competitors. Well, if that happens, then you know how do I know that that, that you're the one that's going to win, right? So just be thoughtful about that. Um, you know, then it's uh, uh, then it's things like around the, the the competition, right? So who else is out there doing this? Kind of flows together, right? Differentiation and competition, and um, and and how you're and how you're doing it, and everyone tries to do the um, you know the, the, the kind of the four quadrants, and then your company is is up and to the right, and everyone else is in any other um, quadrant. Uh, 
it's a you know it's a cool tactic, but it, it's not necessarily uh, true, and it, it never really rings true when when we see those. So kind of um, what you have here, I think it's the the um, bottom left, the slide to the bottom left, where you have these kind of like um, Harvey Harvey bullets or whatever Harvey walls that um, call out very specific elements of um, or or feature sets as to why you know. Um, what makes a great product in that space and you kind of say where you are versus the, the, the competition and be you know be be honest about it um, is, is a big thing and then um, then it's about the financials for me um, you know and this 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 tells a lot right this the, the financials tells me how well this entrepreneur really understands the business that they're getting into because if you're um, if you're honing in on the right, um, uh, the right metrics, then I know that you know what's important in in terms of um, running as a, a successful business in whatever space this is. And um, obviously, you want to uh, include some type of a um, snapshot of a P&L, where you are today and where you are maybe two, possibly three years out. Um, two years is probably enough because we're at beyond this coming year. You're guessing. Um, but obviously there you want to see you know um, revenue you want to see gross margin you want to see um, <clears throat> you want to see uh, operating expenses and you want to see um, the profit or, or loss uh, see when companies are going to break even and on that slide I'd, I'd love to see you know a couple bullets of what your assumptions are right so um, or you know it could be in in kind of that uh, table format as well where you're saying, okay, well, we're projecting that we're going to grow a revenue by $10 million in a year. Well, how are you going to do that, right? Um, how many customers, uh, how many additional customers is, does that um, consider? Or are you upselling to existing customers? Or are they converting from one plan to another or whatever? Just uh, help, help me to, to understand why the aggressive jump in, um, in revenue is happening. And usually the jumps are aggressive. Um, and you know, obviously, we want to hear something about um, uh, where the product is, um, where it's where it's going, um, how how these funds are going to help to to do that, or how the funds are going to help to um, to to grow your market share. Uh, and and obviously, we want to hear about the team and why this team is well positioned to um, produce this type of uh, um, this type of solution and, and why you're the, you know why back you right? Why are you the the, the winning team? Um, those are the main, the, the primary things, and try to keep it, you know, um, within ten to twelve slides. Yeah, and and there's lots of there's there are lots of examples of of slide sets, um, pitch decks um, online that you can view. Um, you know, the uh, a comment that I get from from entrepreneurs a, a lot is. Well, wow, I just can't imagine how I'm going to be able to fit my presentation or everything that I need to say and, and, and everything I need to communicate into 10 to 12 slides. And I say you have to do it. Um, you know, Guy Kawasaki, who's a, who's you know who's who's a, a grandfather in the space, um, has this 10, 20, 30 rule that you should probably get familiar with, which is that um, you know it should be 10 slides. Um, the presentation should last 20 minutes, um, and you should use no lesser, no smaller than a 30 font. Um, in your slides, and 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 so it's about getting that message, um, you know, pulling it, making it easily uh, communicable um, to your investors and to to the audience. Um, you know, don't try to just slam a whole bunch of information on there again. Um, that just you know, it just shows that you're not able to communicate uh, your value proposition um, properly, and it's a, it's a bad sign. So you you know you know being able to send the message concisely is a is very very important, and 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 you need to be able to do that, and and you can't just you know have a whole bunch of slides trying to communicate what you're trying to communicate. Yeah, and just remember, right? Uh, the the purpose of the of the slide deck in in most cases is to get you to a meeting with um, you know either you know, senior associate, venture partner, or even a, a general partner. So you don't have to have every single detail in there. You just have to have the important elements of it. Um, and and when you get into that conversation, whether it be a phone call or whether it be an in-person meeting, 
you will have an opportunity to, um, to, to tell us all the things that, um, that aren't listed on the slide. Um, but you, you want to share all the things that's going to pop and jump out to us and, and make us um, curious and want to learn more. Yeah, they'll you'll, they'll have lots of opportunities to dig into all the details that you want to sh you want to share with them, um, and, and hopefully that's where you want to get to all of these things. Whether it's the the elevator pitch or the executive summary um, or the or the pitch deck, it's all about take getting getting you to the next step, right? And every single step is going to get a little bit more into more detail, more due diligence. You'll have plenty of opportunities um, to dive into all those things that you want to talk about. Um, but it's about getting the attention and getting to the next step, whether it's uh, a, 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 um, a, a meeting with, a, with an associate um, or you know, next, next step would be the due diligence and, and ultimately, obviously, getting a, a wire coming into your, uh, into your account. Great. So let's, let's move on to the particulars of the financials within the pitch deck because that can get a little more granular versus some of these other slides. Um, sir, can you kind of give you know, the attendees kind of an overview of these? And Marlon, you can kind of chime in from the VC perspective as well as far as what you're looking for? Yeah, absolutely. And, and Marlon already alluded to it, and, and, and I think he hit the nail on the head, which is that you know, understanding your financials, this is, that's what it's about, right? I mean, you may have a great idea, but if there's in a market, um, if there's in a big enough market, and if, it, and if, and if you're not able to, to grab that market um, in a meaningful way, it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be, you know, very favorable um, to any investor who's going to be looking at your company. And so understanding, you know, everything about the market, and, and you know, I get this comment of, well, you know, it's too early. I, I don't understand it. I don't, ha I, don't, I don't know what the size of the market is. Well, you know what? You're going to have to do research. If you don't know what the size of the market is, um, that, then you're not going to get an investment from, from investors. Um, but, you know, what are the key drivers, right, of, of, of your, your financial model? And it's not just, you know, revenue and you just can't grow it. Um, exponentially, just because you know, just because it looks good on 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 a on a, on a um, spreadsheet or or on a uh, chart, um, but it's about about thinking through the assumptions, thinking through what has to happen. We talk about things like top down revenue projections versus bottoms up um, uh, expense um, structures and 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 also revenue projections. Really understanding your market, um, how you're going to attack the market, where the where the revenue is going to come from, and the um, uh, and and the cost that you're going to have to bear, the resources you're going to have to you know both um, uh, buy and to hire um, in order to actually achieve that kind of revenue. The timing of it um, is 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 really really critical. Um, Marlon talked about doing a PNL. You will absolutely have to do a some sort of a high level PNL. Um, with the assumptions, um, and, and, and to Marlon's point, assumptions is really the key here, um, because we can make spreadsheets say whatever we want to say, um, right? And, but it's really about the assumptions. I can tell you that I can build a financial model um, probably to you know, 90 to 95 percent accuracy with probably 10 assumptions, main assumptions, right? But don't worry about all those tiny little things um, that aren't going to have a big impact on the numbers, but really focus on the 10 to 12 big assumptions that's going to drive the entire model um, and list that out and be able to justify it and, and be able to explain it um, when someone asks you because those are the things that, that the investors are probably going to key in on because they know what the drivers of the revenue growth, they know the drivers of, of the cash requirements are going to be um, and they're going to hone in on it. So you need to understand that stuff um, like the back of your hand. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the, and, and, and actually the, the milestones, right? And, and this is where I kind of want to, I, I want to focus a little bit on milestones. You know, we're big, big believers in milestone financing. Um, you know, Marlon talked about different, um, different stages of financing, C, A, B, C. Um, and, and it's about, um, because you're going to do, in most cases, multiple rounds of equity financing. Each of those financing rounds should um, be targeted at hitting some major, major milestones. Because if you think about the valuation of your company, it doesn't, over time, it's not a straight line, it's not a curve, right? You're going to hit, it's going to be step functions, hopefully step functions up. And those step functions, big increases in valuation are going to happen when you hit major milestones. 
And so it's about finding enough, enough financing in a, in a given round to make sure that you hit that next milestone so that when you go for that second round of financing or the third round of financing, that you're able to um, you're able to do it at a, a, a much greater valuation than the, than the last round of finance. So, you know, um, the financial should help you, the financial projection should help you really hone in on what those milestones are um, and, and that's kind of what your, your, your funding ask should be, right, is the amount of cash that you need to make sure you hit those milestones, give you enough uh, cushion to hit those milestones so that when you go for the next round of financing, and you're going to do it at a much higher valuation. Yes, yeah, exactly right. Um, I, I encourage <clears throat> companies to, to raise money at 18-month uh, clicks, right? So what are you looking to achieve within the next 18 months? And what is it going to, what resources are required um, in order for you to achieve those? And basically you take that and you, and you work in reverse, right? You, you build you build your financial model um, based on on those assumptions and, and be realistic um, and then obviously factor in some some slippage right uh, everything's not going to go a hundred percent according to plan so you know maybe you increase um, <clears throat> increase the, uh, the the spend or whatever by by ten percent um, just to, to cover any any um, unforeseen circumstances. But yeah, 18 months, um, typical runway is what, what you raise for. Um, and, and be realistic in terms of, um, uh, Cirque started mentioning valuation. So be realistic um, in, in that sense, right? You want to, <clears throat> you don't want to have to grow into too large of a, of a valuation at, at every stage. It's just too much pressure on, on the company. Um, and while the two, the, the only, the <laughs> Realistically, the two um, times when valuation truly matters and are truly meaningful is, you know, when the first money comes into the to the to the company because it kind of sets the stage for ownership going forward, and then um, at an exit, right? So most companies will will have dips in, in valuations. Um, by and large, most companies will have dips in valuations. The 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 key is to bring them up, and those dips usually occur because the, um, the the pricing of the previous round was was a bit too aggressive so keep that in mind too optimize for the long haul as opposed to um, you know for you know, the sexy valuation today really great point Marvin this is fantastic thank you again gentlemen we've got uh, about three or four minutes here for uh, some Q&A. Uh, both Serge and Marlon's contact information is there as well as the Twitter handle, so I encourage you to follow both. Um, we'll pull up a few of the questions that we've gotten here um, today. And anything, as I mentioned, um, anything that we can't cover here, I'll follow up with you afterwards uh, directly and get your question answered um, as quickly as possible. All right, uh, so the first question we've got coming up here, um, and this question uh, can go to, to either of you or both. Um, do you foresee a slowdown in fundraising with the public markets and the impact we've seen recently? Um, it depends on the, on the stage. Uh, so I think definitely at the at later stage companies, there will absolutely be, um, or later stage um, rounds, there will definitely be um, slowdowns. Um, you know, those are bigger check sizes, and it's closer to to the exit um, opportunity. Uh, so you know, people are going to, uh, investors are going to be uh, much more careful there. I haven't seen a lot um, in the C to, to Series A phase, and I uh, there may be a slight slowdown, but I don't see it happening um, at at a big clip. Right, uh, venture firms raise capital um, to invest it over a finite period of time. Um, so for instance, typically in a 10-year in a fund, you'll have you know, a five-year investment period. Uh, so you, you know, responsibly, you, you try to invest um, uh, during, that, during that time. And um, you're holding back some of your investment dollars to be able to follow on on, on, on uh, the companies that, you know, that you've made initial investments in. 
Uh, so it's 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 usually baked in, and I think the good firms are you know planning for basically every every 12 to 18 months being able to um, participate in the next round of, of their companies. Um, but where I guess uh, kind of talking on both sides of my mouth here, where you could see a slowdown there is, is if it's uh, let's say you part you know you're an early stage investor and you participate in the C and the A, and now you've got to do do the B. And you know that there's going to be some slowdown um, with you know Series B and later um, stage in investors. Well, now you've got to think through. Okay, um, how much money do I need to reserve to help um, you know my higher performing companies weather kind of the storm of um, you know of, of the delayed in investment. Um, but again, um, going back to the other side of my mouth. <laughs> um, <laughs> You, you typically you typically see good companies um, with good metrics um, receive venture financing um, in in downturns and upturns um, because they're good companies and they make sense as investments. Um, I think what you at the end of the day I think what what will change um, and I think in in a lot of cases for the better is um, the valuations will will come down. Uh, to, to be more in line with uh, what we've seen historically. So hopefully. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Marlon. No, go on, go on. Oh no, I was I was gonna I was gonna echo what what Marlon said. You know, we we you know, except for in very very extreme cases, um, both um, on the upside and on the downside, you know, we do see kind of you know there may be some some, some gradations, um, but we do c continue to see good investment at the really early stages of, of companies too. To Marlon's point, all the reasons why VCs raise money and, and, and they're expected to invest it. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the valuation um, is the valuation. I think Marlon had really, really great points about you know how that fluctuates. Um, and then, and then you know, the, and then to, to Marlon's point also about good companies getting funded. You know, where you see, um, uh, I guess, the big difference between a, uh, a a a good market versus a bad market. Uh, for entrepreneurs is kind of in those in those you know secondary type of companies, right? The ones that in good times may be able to raise some money because investors are really going after opportunities and they have a lot of cash to invest. Um, whereas in, in in tougher times, those companies are probably um, are less apt um, to get funded. But good companies are going to get funded um, in in good times and bad. Great. Uh, a couple more questions here we've got time for. Uh, a quick one here. Is it necessary to include an exit strategy slide in your pitch deck? I think you should be thinking about it. Um, up to you whether or not you want to include it. I, um, you know, I'm typically going to have some opinion on, um, <clears throat> on, on how a, a particular uh, company or prospective investment may exit. Um, but yeah, you better be thinking about that, right? Like, does this actually and, and be realistic? Does this company actually have the potential to to become a publicly traded company, or um, you know, is this something that would be purchased by some of the um, some of the giants that that you're going to be providing these services to? Uh, so just be realistic in your um, in your thought process. Obviously, I want I always want to hear that you're going to swing for the fences, but it needs to be realistic. All right, I think we've got time for one more uh, here on the call, and then we'll wrap it up. Like I said before, uh, I'll follow up with each of you individually on any questions we didn't get answered. Um, an interesting one here, what circumstances would you opt to forego fundraising and just reinvest profits back into the company? I'm sorry, Jason, can you say that one more time? Sure. What circumstances would you opt to forego fundraising and reinvest profits back into the company? Oh well, I, you know, I can certainly answer that. So it, I, I, you know, kind of comes down to the kind of company you have, right? So if you have a company where you can grow it steadily internally, um, where you can, um, rate, where you're actually making money, making profit, and you're able to invest that, you know, kind of you know, systematically and grow your company over time without raising external financing and and own the company all to yourself, absolutely, that makes a lot of sense for many many companies. Um, the, the, the kind of companies that, that are going to be going after VC financing, though, are the ones who are going to be investing a fair amount of money earlier on. They're not going to have profits. They're going to need 
um, funds to actually get to profitability, and that's why they're raising money. Um, you know, if you see the, if if you're a company that's already profitable, that already has good revenue, and you're you're profitable, but you see a great market opportunity, you know that there's a fair amount, of, there's a a specific amount of time for you to actually go and capture that market and 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 be a leader in that market in this big market that's available to you, and you need um, cash to um, to to be able to uh, accelerate your growth, then you do it. Um, and, and that's kind of when it might make sense to go after VC as opposed to growing internally. Um, but many, many people, many entrepreneurs have been very, very successful and built themselves nice big businesses um, you know, uh, by, by growing it internally from profits. And if you can do that, then absolutely, that's, uh, that should be um, maybe in many cases option number one. It's a, um, it's a function of, of time and, um, and potential uh, from my perspective. So uh, let's say you're, you're building a, a company that has a product that's based on time to market, right? So there's, there's not a huge amount of technology differentiation or even process differentiation. So, uh, but but it's, a, you know, it's a viable solution, it's needed, um, it, it's going to take off. Well, then you'd raise venture capital dollars because you've got you've to get it out there and blow well ahead of any potential competitors before they have a chance to, to catch up, and then once you're the um, <clears throat> once you're the market leader, you know, then it makes it makes life difficult for everyone else. Uh, so that's the that's the time. Then from a um, uh, I guess and from a uh, a potential perspective, like again, can this be a multi-billion-dollar business? If it can be, then then yeah, it makes sense to, to raise venture capital um, dollars. If this is, you know, maybe a, um, a twenty million dollar business ultimately, or something like that, then um, then no, it doesn't. Um, one, you're not going to be able to raise venture financing because um, it, it just won't make sense for um, for VCs. And two, uh, it doesn't make sense for you to um, give away um, or trade a part of your uh, your company um, for for that size of a of a um, venture. All right. Uh, that, I think that's going to do it for us today. Uh, Cirque, Marlon, thank you very much for participating. Uh, everyone that's on the call, we will send out an email within the next 24 hours. They'll have a download link uh, with this presentation just as it was presented with the audio as well. So you'll have access to this that you can keep handy. And again, you'll be able to get it from our website as well, earlygrowthfinancialservices.com. Uh, thank you again to our presenters, and if you have anything else, you can contact us through our website, or you can email me directly, Jay Kennedy, like the president, at earlygrowthfinancialservices.com. Otherwise, that will do it. Thank you again, and have a good rest of the week. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Sir. Take care.